Benjamin Rasmussen, Kristen Sink, and Lottie McGinnis, and this panel will be moderated by our curator, Simon Walken. We'll be talking about the photograph and compassionate responsiveness, which actually is very, uh, very much uh, in that linked to our discussion today. Um, our next Arts and Medicine Monday, March 18th, Abraham Nussbaum will be here. Um, he's Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Chief Education Officer at Denver Health. And he will be um, talking on Health Against My Will, the Ethics of Involuntary Psychiatric Health. So some of you probably know Dr. Nussbaum. He is a very animated and very um, intelligent speaker. So that should be um, a really good presentation. OK. So um, for our discussion today, our presentation today, um, which actually fits very well with yeah, the Denver Month of Photography, um, I want to introduce you to our speaker today, Max. Um, Greg has been a psychotherapist for over 30 years. His area of specialization is individuals and families diagnosed with chronic or life-threatening illnesses. He started his career in HIV AIDS services and then moved on to, uh, into oncology services. He is also a gifted artist and works with textiles. His pilgrimage guided him towards the study of visual anthropology, especially art and healing, and his dissertation, Artists and Illness, Influence of Narrative on Autobiography and Meaning Making, explored the intersection of diagnosis, Medication and treatment of um, personal narratives. He has been a quilter for over 20 years, and his work has been shown in galleries, museums, and art centers. And so, let me introduce to you Greg Katz, who will be talking on just an extraordinarily interesting topic about women or photographers. Um, no surprise, many of them have not received the recognition or the attention they deserve. So, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today, and I'm going to uh, do two things. First is, if, you, if your phone's not out, pull your phone out. I know that that's something that people never ask me to do. But as I tell you about why, how I, how I got out, I'm so excited, how I got into this today. <laughs> um, I want you to take just a quick look at the picture by the song, not your selfies. Say, take a picture and say to yourself, what are the inspiration and motivation? Just kind of write three words down. <clears throat> I want to thank Dr. Stone for her and Winnie for starting the Certificate of Healthcare and Ethics because that's how I got to this topic. Um, I got a flyer that said one of the courses that was going to be allowed was going to be a course on women in war. Now, the interesting thing is, I figured that the course would be predominantly women. And I wasn't disappointed. Two men, 24 women, two female professionals. Not a surprise for me, I'm the president of Front Range Contemporary Quilters, which is an art quilting group in the area. It's me and 200 women. <laughs> so, I was, so I was used to it, which was good because part of what came out of this was looking at gender roles and gender issues as women in the military. Now we're going to talk today about how women that were in the military, but women who were in uh, war zones. I, I when, when I decided on a final project, I went to Dr. Jean Scanlon and I said, "Look, I said I know we're looking at women in war, and we're going to, there's going to be a lot of talk on uh, military sexual assault and veterans' affairs uh, and VA benefits and drug abuse and homelessness." 
He said, yeah, I'm a visual anthropologist. And he says, I tell stories. I look at stories and culture together and how they go. Would it be okay if I did this project on women working hard? And both uh, Dean and Mark Trayvall, who I'm a cult Trayvall, who if you have a chance to get corpus, we definitely do that. Um, Say, go ahead, go for it. So that's what I did. What I didn't know was going to happen was that I was going to start this project and that these women were going to become some of my best friends for the last 10 months. Because once I started to study them and hear their stories and see their photographs and look at the obstacles that they had, and not only the obstacles on how they got into working in the military, but the, the things that we all face when we face trauma, PTSD, family issues, being away from home, um, they're very real. And, and these women were addressed. So if you look at a photograph of yours, is there anyone that could that would be willing to share your three words or either your motivation or your inspiration? Inspiration, family, and friends. There you go. Uh, new temporary documentation. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I that I wanted to start with this is because we're going to be looking at why would these women want to go to war zone? Why would not just the women? Why would a photojournalist want to go to a war zone? knowing what the risks are for them. So I saw this and uh, suffering equal change of interpretation, and that's the big part for me about art. Right? We all look at a piece of art, and we all interpret it in our own way. What does it mean to you? Which gets into whole, the whole thing about meaning making, but, but if you were to use this as a mathematical equation, Suffering would mean different things to everyone in this room because your interpretation of what we're going to see is going to be different. I am going to do, put out one caveat, and that is if you're sensitive to war, anything related to war, and there are some pretty graphic photographs more later on, to, it, when we do time travel from the earlier war photographers to modern day war photographers, um, please take care of yourself. Uh, if you want to talk about it afterwards, uh, I'm certainly going to talk about it. Um, but I just want you to know that these photos are going to be there, so we shouldn't be surprised at so. so, when I thought about this talk, when I, when I restructured it, I really thought about not just the picture, but what do we know about the women, or what will we learn about the women? And it's not just about women work harder. It's about women in male-dominated fields. Medicine. In the medical campus. What's it like to be a woman in a man's world? In, in Stoker, America, Cheryl Sandberg wrote uh, lean, lean In, I think it was the book. Um, and the reason is, is because we're going to look at things like risk-taking, courage, building networks and how to use those networks to get where you want to be. Peggy Hall is a great example. Peggy Hall was from 1915. <clears throat> Peggy Hall wanted to photograph during World War I, and they wouldn't let her do it. They wouldn't accredit her as a work problem. So Peggy Hull is very smart. She thought, who do I know that might give me a leg up? Well, during the, the American-Spanish uh, Mexican dispute in 1916, she met General Mark. She did what she needed to do. She called General Mark and said, this is what I want. I'd like to get credited as a, as a war photojournalist. And you help me. He, he heard her out. Sent a letter to the accredited, accredited bodies and said, Look, if the only reason you're not accrediting her 
is that she's a woman, you better think twice. She's the first American accredited female dwarf arbiter in the country. So the important thing, right? Develop contact early on, keep track of who you have contact with, stay in touch with them, and hopefully, if you need them, that the relationship is a mutual and that it will help you in some way, shape, or form. Gerda Taro is not a real name. Gerda, Gerda Taro and Robert Kappa, Robert Kappa is probably one of the most famous war photographers, they both had Jewish surnames and didn't feel safe, and they both changed their names. So she became Gerda Taro. They were very interested in um, what was happening in Europe, especially the Spanish Civil War. So they went to Spain and they decided she was actually building his career. She was taking photographs under his name because she didn't feel that she was going to be accepted or that her work was going to be shown. Or that she was going to be taken seriously as a soldier. And then at some point she says, you know what, I have to this. I'm going to stand on my own two feet. I'm going to start putting out the work that I want to put out. And um, unfortunately, she has a very tragic end to her life story. She's taking these photographs, uh, and she's getting ready to come back to the United States. She takes the photographs, jumps on the footboard of a vehicle that's um, transporting wounded wound soldiers, and the vehicle gets T-boned by a tank, and she gets crushed at the age of 26. Her husband, Robert Kappa, is famous for the saying, if your photo is not good enough, it means you're not close enough. So, this is in Malaga. These are refugees from the, during the Spanish Civil War. Next one, there have been an air raid, and these are people that are waiting outside of the morgue. They either claim the bodies of loved ones, identify the bodies of loved ones, or see if the loved one is actually dead or alive. Margaret Bork White. Margaret Bork White is one of these people that, if you had a chance to be friends with, you probably want to be friends with. Uh, she's one of the more noted photographer, uh, women war photographers. She wrote an autobiography called Portrait of Myself. Um, probably a little narcissistic. Not too much. Um, so she started off as a photographer of industrial and commercial sites. So someone like me, when I when I looked at her stuff as a textile artist, I'm really intrigued by pattern, and that's what she was really looking at when she was doing these commercial and industrial sites, she was climbing on an oil rig, she was climbing on skyscrapers um, and taking these photographs. So we know from the beginning that she's got some physical integrity to her as she's gonna make that transition from doing these commercial and industrial sites to uh, war photography. She gets her first assignment. She shows up with 850 pounds worth of two cases. And they say to her, no way, no how. <laughs> she dropped it down to 250. She says, this is about the lowest I can go. She says, I still need my stuff. But some of the things that happened to her um, was they, um, no one was going to allow her to do really what she really wanted to do. And, that, and that's really a problem. So she's got to figure out a way to get around, right? And um, she tries to, to uh, let me see if I can see the photo. So this is Buchenwald. She was at the liberation of Buchenwald. Why is this important? It's important because her photograph were we'll used in the Nuremberg trial to show that the atrocities are real. She 
she really, really went through a lot of stuff. She, um, she had been in air raids. Basically, she's the equivalent of the invincible Molly Brown. She wanted to go uh, fly an airplane with some of the military, and they said, absolutely not, it's too dangerous. They said, you're going to have to take a boat. She said, okay. The boat was torpedo. She helps bring all of these uh, guys onto land. Um, they still didn't want to give her credit for this. So uh, she went through a, a lot of atrocities. Black Magazine called her uh, um, Maggie the Another one of the photos. Now, at this time, so Bird Haro uh, was around 1937. That's when the handheld camera, we, we shifted into a 35 millimeter camera at that time, which made a huge difference for war photography. No longer did you have the big camera, good tripod, but it's hard to move. You had something now that's portable, you could, you could carry with you, you could conceal if you had to, which is going to be one of the things we're going to see coming up. Um, it changed the way work photography happened. Mark, Mark um, Now, Mark She covered the Spanish Civil War. She, she, she saw what was happening. Meet me day was coming. Couldn't figure out how she was going to get there. She stowed away on a hospital boat, in the bathroom of a hospital boat. She got caught. <laughs> they put her in a, uh, when they got to land, they put her basically on house arrest in a nurse's tent. She said, well, this isn't going to work. How am I going to get my work done? So she escaped, and she hitched a ride with an Italian pilot who got the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> The big thing about Martha Wilhelm, which was interesting, you know, in entrepreneurship, they say create a need and then fill it. A lot of times we look at where are the gaps in service, right, as providers. Where are the gaps in service and how can we, how can we fill that gap? She thought the same way. She was very, very thoughtful in her process about how she was going to differentiate herself from her male counterpart. And what she noticed was the male photographer didn't seem to go to the hospital where the wounded and dead were. They liked the action, they liked being on the field, but they weren't doing the up close and personal. And she says, that's my ticket. And that was her ticket. Um, she, she says, and this is her quote, this is where you see what war really costs. Essentially, her and somebody else took the photo. <laughs> Margaret Higgins. One of the, the, if you read the information on, on women in war, one of the things early on was how can we have women there? The sexual attraction, the sexual tension is going to be too much. These women are going to be seductresses. Well, unfortunately, that was actually the case with Marguerite Higgins. Marguerite Higgins was a young war photographer who has an affair with an officer who's married and has four children. He eventually leaves his wife, marries Marguerite Higgins, and they have two more children. That doesn't detract from her work. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's really. She's actually, uh, she, she was one of six in 1951 that won a Pulitzer Prize for war photography uh, of the Korean War. So, you know, earlier I talked about whose shoulders do you stand on, what contacts do you make, 
how will you use these contracts? What about hierarchy? The military is very hierarchical. Corporations are very hierarchical. She wanted, she started doing photography, journal, photojournalism. She really wanted to get into war photography. The editors weren't going to like it. She said, you know, I think there's got to be a way around this. And her way around this was she leapfrogged over the editor's heads. And she went to the owner of the newspaper, what? Ellen Rogers Reed, and said to her, Look, this is what I want to do. Do you think you can help me? And lo and behold, she got a foreign assignment. Not a bad thing. So she does here for a while, goes over to Tokyo, she's now in Japan. She's in Japan for a little bit, she goes over to Korea. She's in Korea as the Korean War is going to break out, and she gets she gets orders to go back to Japan. And she says, like, are you crazy? Do you know what this is an opportunity in well, my voice? Is Who does she call? She calls Helen Rogers Reed. Why is that good? Because Helen Rogers Reed was friends with General MacArthur. General MacArthur said, let her stay. And she did. This was the deal. They said basically, we're not making any special accommodations. You dress like us, you eat like us, you work like us. She said, I can do that. It's not a problem. You want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. Good old morning. Dickie Chappelle is probably my, my, um, my spirit guide. I find her so fascinating. So she started in the 1930s doing war photography. Back early on, you were not allowed to show a wounded, uh, a wounded person uh, in the dust. They were afraid that it would taint the story of war as people were coming back to the United States. She said, you know, what if we reframe it, or what if I reframe it, so that the pictures that we're showing of injured, we use to bring people in for blood ties. Right? You need blood during the war. It's got a lot of people that are hurt. Or what if we reframe it so that this is not about propaganda, but this is about... <coughs> Um, in 1943, President Roosevelt changed the rules that you were now allowed to show injured and dying people in the news media. That was a big turning point because now we were getting a different narrative. The story was changing. Maybe the story was getting more real. Maybe we were pulling on more heartstrings than we did before. Which would do one of three things, right? Now you have two camps. Those are now who are really opposed to it, and they really know what's going on, and those that are in total support of what's going on. So, Vicky Chappelle, one of the things was that she did, she went undercover, she started taking photos uh, in Hungary. When the Hungarians were fighting Soviet rule, she got caught. She had a 35 millimeter camera that she was having, she got caught. She was put in solitary confinement. And then asked to leave the country and never return. The other thing is about Vicky Chappelle is that she didn't stop. So, one of the things I want, I want you to notice on all the women that I've shown you so far, these women were all wearing military. They were not in the military, but they were all wearing military uniforms. She goes to Southeast Asia. She gets to jump out of planes with the Marines. She did 30 parachute jumps with the Marines in Vietnam. 
Unfortunately, if you suppose Gillian Field, when uh, she was uh, embedded in the unit and uh, someone in the unit tripped an IED and she died from injuries related to the explosive. So if you notice, Dick, Dickie Chappelle's hair is up under her hat. And her claim to fame that everybody talks about is she always wore pearl earrings so that all the guys would know that there was a woman there. These are up close and personal pictures. This is not. We're going to time travel. We're going to kind of come up more to the present. So Lindsay Adario, if you haven't read Lindsay's book, I really recommend it. It's called, It's What I Do, A Photographer's Life of Love and War. Really well written and the photos are really phenomenal. As a war correspondent and the mother, I've learned to live in two different realities, but it's my choice. I choose to live in peace and witness war to experience war from people but to remember the beauty. Um, to get to our question earlier, when you and I were talking, um, she's a mother. And one of the questions she asked was, because she, she gets this all the time, if you're a mother, how can you go to war? And she says, how come nobody asks men the same question? All the male war photographers have kids. Did nobody ask them what it would be like for them to be without their father? Why is everybody asking me what it would be like to be without their mother? This is kind of looks like even the playing field. So that's Lindsay Gardner. At one point, uh, so Lindsay started off, she's one of four daughters. Her parents divorced. Her father came out and had a new partner. Um, they were giving each of the daughters $15,000 for the wedding. She says, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to get married. I really want to do this photography thing. Can you advance me my wedding money? I won't ask you for another dime to help me. I'll take the $15,000. I'll buy equipment. I'll get training. I'll do this. And this will be my life. And they said, sure. So she starts to do this. And someone says to her, how, or she says to me, how, how am I going to get into this? And she says, well, you really need a lot of experience. So her first assignment was um, photographing transgender sex workers in the meat market in New York. So she'd go out Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, and she'd make friends with all, all, all the sex workers. And then, you know, she was kind of in the neighborhood, and she'd go out with people who were all these sex workers to come up to her. Up to her and her friends were all the like, yeah, they're my friends. Um, but she realized that she really wanted to play on a much bigger stage than looking at, at sex workers. And someone said, well, then you're going to need sort of bigger experience. You better figure out how to do this in the now. I should talk about it. She starts to take pictures and she's she a stringer, which means she's basically a higher gun, whoever needs her to work for. Um, so most stuff in South, South America comes back. This has a discussion about going to Afghanistan. She goes to Afghanistan in 2000. This is before 2001. This is before 9 11. You need a you need a visa. They have, they want to know you're there, especially an American and a photographer. We don't just get to walk around freely. Someone sneaks her in to live in Afghanistan the week before she's supposed to show up. She has this uh, family. He basically takes her in and starts to show her the underground schools for girls. Underground both meaning secret, but also underground of all these people facing. And showing that these girl, young girls are being educated against Taliban, which meant that it was all ties that were at the time. She finishes her week. She basically leaves the country to come back in legally. She spends time there. Um, you know, they, they say things to her like, you better play by the rules. 
you better be respectful of the religion. And you never let the man in the eye. Uh, your head must be covered at all times. You didn't have to wear a burqa. You did have to have the head covered at all times. Uh, no skin showing. So you won't see. Um, at one point, she goes in to meet the head of the Taliban because she plays the wife of some other other journalist that was actually invited to come in. And, and the journalist says, I hope you all meet mine. I brought my wife. And they were so flustered at the fact that a woman was in the room that didn't notice that she had cameras. And she took pictures. Then 9 uh, 11 happened. She wants to have come on. She comes back and really starts a war. These are so the PKK is, a, is the Kurdish Workers Party. So it's, 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 this is what she saw. These are the lives of these women. Man does what he can, the woman does what man cannot. So the other thing about Lindsay Azario, Lindsay Azario was found with three other male photographers, and they in Libya, and they were captured, they were kidnapped. And they spent six days basically pleading for their lives to get face down in the dirt. Bravo. Bravo. The entire time she was sexually assaulted while she was there, she was continuously broke. Um, but she got out of Iran, as did her three times also. Tamara Abul Alouf is the first Palestinian woman war photographer. There's a lot of things. That little cooking pot to her left that says TV, that's her protection. That is something that looked like a baseball umpire's vest because she had no funds and no one would support her. So this is how she went out to take photos. The interesting thing about her is she has five children. It's why a lot of the photographs she takes are of women and children. That's her at work. I'm always interested when these photos show up because obviously somebody else took it. <laughs> so that's kind of the best that she had, which looks like you know, vinyl. It wasn't until some uh, NGO came in and offered to buy her a real helmet and a flak jacket and the protective material that she would need so that she could get herself killed. Um, but the other thing that, and you'll see, certainly happened with Lindsay Azaria when she went to uh, these underground schools, it certainly happened with Mark, is women are able to take photos that men can't because they have access that men don't. In countries like, like Afghanistan, a man is not going to go in and take pictures of women. They, they are not going to go in and interview women, but a woman can. And that was their entree, and that's her as well. So the hand is there for scale. The piece that was extracted from a 16 year old girl. After an Israeli interception. That's beautiful. She's been to a baby that was rescued from, from, from his mother after the mother was killed from the airstrike, from the Israeli airstrike. So the thing, you know, it's interesting because when I was when I was preparing these. 
different parts of the world have different views of Palestine, and different views of Israel, who's good, who's bad, who's right, who's wrong. And, and I have to say, I was concerned in the United States, would, would it be okay to show something that was not pro-Israel? This is their point of view. She's in there with the mix. <laughs> she is in there. So this is a funeral. Again. Now you have to remember, right? She's a Palestinian woman. This is not like she's an Israeli woman in Palestine. She's a Palestinian woman who's telling from her narrative and her life experience and her story. Which is what we're also going to get from North Kelsey. She's Syrian. She's 25 years old at the time that she starts doing work photography. She was an English teacher. She's Syrian, so she went to college to teach English. And she was walking around uh, uh, Aleppo, and a famous work photographer happened to have been there and saw her taking photos with her cell phone. He saw her interest. He asked her to look at some of her photos. He said, you know, you're pretty good, but you like to do this. She said, do what? Said, Report. Take photos. Show the world what it's like in war torn cities from a woman's perspective. And she did. So, um, what did she run into as a Syrian woman? This versus a foreigner, right? This is not an American going in and taking pictures of Syria. This is a Syrian woman going in and taking, taking pictures of people she knew and loved and her neighborhood and those that were fighting against her. First thing was they thought she was a spy. The problem. They didn't think that she could be trusted. And what she really wanted to explain to them was. This is about the aftermath. She says, I'm not here to show the rubble. Because there's plenty of people taking, taking pictures of those from the Assad regime. There's plenty of people that are taking pictures of men in the street. But who's taking, who's taking the other pictures? Who's taking pictures of what's left behind? Because it's what happens, right? They do it, and everybody moves on. She says, but that's not the end of the story. She says, because you have all these men, women, and children who are dying, still dying by sniper fire, who are still dying by airstrikes. She says, and these are the conditions that they're living in, and who's going to help them? She says, if I don't tell the story, they're going to move on to the next place of conflict and just let it be. So these are women fighting. This is about women in power. This is about the courage that these women in Syria have to start to take on their own neighbor, to start to take on what they can, what they can preserve, what they can defend. Um, someone asked her, are you afraid of dying? An interesting question, right? And she said, if you look around, if you listen to the stories of family and friends, there are young girls throughout this city washing dishes who are dying from mortar shells. She said, why do I have the right to die too? A big statement. A big statement. And the last one is Nicole Toms. Nicole was born and raised in Hong Kong. She came to the United States and graduated from uh, NYU. And she goes to Syria. So now we're going to look at two different kinds of pictures, right? Because she goes to Syria, and at first, people are grateful that she's there. She's an international photographer. 
the hope is that if she puts out these photos to the world, someone will help us. Someone will come save us. Someone will deliver aid. Someone will obstruct the atrocities that are happening here on a daily, on a daily basis. This is a picture of a young boy who's trying to tell the people that he's walking into, I'm not going to hurt you. Man who has been far enough. The problem that the Syrians found was it didn't matter whether or not these pictures went out to the world. In their opinion, nobody's helping them. They still feel abandoned. They still feel like there's no resources. And yet they had let them these photographers in from all across the world in hopes of relief. Now they feel betrayed. Basically, what they want are the international photographers get the heck out of Dodge. Because if you're not going to help us, basically you're hurting us. Because now you're feeding stories we don't want you to feed. And if it's not going to help us, then we really have to do that. Now we see these pictures that we've looked at throughout, and the question is, can you imagine yourself living in these kinds of conditions? Yes, you can look at burned out buildings after a protest. But that's a building These are cities. These are cities. This is their everyday life. That they somehow have come to normalize. And in, in these cases, these folks from Syria feel we're exploited so that they can tell a story. And yet these photographers, they're going to move on to the next place. She's actually changed her focus. She's just doing much more women's issues and uh, maternal health, as is Lindsay Zaria. Lindsay Vario went back to Africa and uh, started doing maternal and child health photos uh, in Uganda. Fear of the other is natural, inevitable, almost forgivable. And that's why you need courage in order to come together. So as, as we look at this, the interesting thing is that these women war photographers had more access in the military than the women who have joined the military. <clears throat> That's crazy, right? Right, in, in 2013, Leon Kennedy said women are going to be able to fight in all, in all areas of the military. 2016, Ask Carter confirms it. Peggy Hull was in 1917. <laughs> that, I mean, that's crazy. What I want you to think about is in your own life, what connections are you making? What these women did? And, and how will they foster an opportunity for you in the future? to speak your voice. I think one of the things, I was fortunate enough to take the course that Tess gave on film, uh, healthcare, and advocacy. And the final project was for the, it was for the pharmacy students, that they all had to do three and five minute uh, movies on something that they would advocate for. And I have to say, my original thought was, being that they were science people, that they were really going to phone dial this in. They were going to just phone the assignment in. And they did. They produced, it was eight films. They produced films of things that were meaningful. The work was well done. They were things that not were they kind of interested in, but that really impacted them. And that's 
how what you see in the work. And that's the work that they're going to go out and do in the world, just like these women that we look at today, past and present. You know, earlier I was saying, I don't think many women, young girls are growing up saying, gee, I want to be a, a war photographer. But I think when you look at the work of some of these women that we've seen today, perhaps you are going to see women who say, I'd like to be a photojournalist wherever that takes me in the world, because I have something to say, I have something to share, and I think it would be a great opportunity. Also about curse. What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid of it? How do you get over that fear? Does what you stand for, or what the story you want to tell, something? And what risks are you going to take? I was telling David earlier, I said, I started this project off as a final assignment for class and have fallen in love with these women and really feel to some degree like they're my friends. In fact, I had a dream a couple of them the other night, which is kind of funny. It was like we were having this discussion, but it's kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> but I think they have such stories to tell of, you know, come on. Barbara Burke White, you're not going to let her fly in a plane, you have to take a boat, and the boat gets hit by a torpedo. I mean, what are the odds? And to follow that up with Vicky Chappelle, who gets to jump out of the plane with wings 30 times in Vietnam. So I think I hope you take some of those and see how you might apply those principles to your own life. I hope you read at least the Agarro book. I think it's great. Um, and I really want to thank you for your time and sharing this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Use the microphone, please. Take the women in the workforce. When it comes up again, take the women in the workforce. It's worth it. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Brad. We really appreciate this. Thanks.